This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 168, recorded on December 28th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Wadsworth, Illinois, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. People may be wondering why you're in Wadsworth. You're visiting. I'm up at, I'm visiting my, my brother, the fireman and his family for, for the holiday. So I came up and have been freezing ever since I got off the plane. Uh, yesterday, it was minus five for the high during the height of the day. Today, it's warmed up a whopping 10 degrees. It's actually five degrees now. And You're talking Celsius, aren't you? No. Uh, well, they're not, no, I'm talking seriously Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Mm. Fahrenheit. That is Fahrenheit. really cold. I thought yesterday, it was cold here. The, Yesterday, I went up to Green Bay to see my nephew and his family, and huh. it's a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour drive north of where I'm at, and its high yesterday was minus five, and uh, wow. it was very, very cold. When we were driving up, it was minus nine in the car, mm. Fahrenheit. See, so. it's minus eight Celsius here. I thought that was cold, but wow, you're way below that. Oh, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, where it is a sunny 12 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 11 Celsius. But you don't dip in the minus Fahrenheit's there, do you? Or maybe you do. Well, um, this morning when I woke up, it was minus three Fahrenheit. Wow. So, but it's sunny and the, we have beautiful fresh snow about six or eight inches. Whoa, so it's nice. perfect for the holiday season. We don't have any snow here. Hmm. Today we have a guest on TWIM. It is a crossover from TWIV. He's here right in the studio in New York City with me, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. Can you handle the microbes? I can. In fact, I'm a bona fide microbe uh, aficionado. I have my degree in that area, so I'm I'm really excited to be here. This is my first visit, but I hope it won't be my last. You said you worked on notobiotic I did. mice, but you got rid of the microbes. <laughs> So how could well, you be a microbiologist? As it turns out, <laughs> these were the, the the only way they knew that they were germ-free was to try to culture out bacteria. And you know yeah. now that there are plenty of them that you can't culture. So yeah, these, these may not be germ-free. So you, you should give back your PhD. That's what you're saying. Well, they've never asked for it back. but uh, <laughs> Now, and then a postdoc was where? Remind Rockefeller. And that's where you learned parasitology? That's that's where I learned what I should have been learning at Notre Dame, basically. Oh. So you went there to do parasitology, yeah. but you never did. No, no, I did. I stayed working on the worm that I was working Chickenella. on. Chickenella. I did. Okay. That's right. And these are ages ago that we're talking about. Ages. These are back in the 60s. We're talking about the 60s. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> welcome to TWIM, and uh, hopefully you. you enjoy. All right. As I say, you... You you always know what questions to ask. So yeah. It's always fine. the naive, I don't know questions. <laughs> Uh-oh. We better be on our toes. <laughs> be on our toes. Michelle, you never ran into Dixon when you were here, did you? I don't believe so. Let me try to remember the years I was there. Um, 86, the year of the Mets. Uh, there Mets you go. World there Series. you go. Yeah. Now you're That's... talking. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm a big fan. I've been here since 1971. Yeah, I think so, I left in 86. So I think I came to Columbia when Sam Silverstein moved his lab up oh yeah. from Rockefeller. Yep, and that I knew him. 84. I was a postdoc at Rockefeller for three years. I knew Sam there too. Wow. So that's when I started. I, I joined the lab in 82 and I was nice. a technician there and then moved with him and worked for another year and a half. Oh, you were at I Rockefeller? Started. I was. We yeah. may have met there. It's possible. Because, <laughs> I mean, I used to go back all the time. I was in the Duves group, so I used to go with uh, Mikla Schmuller a lot and uh, talk with I him. I see. Because you must yeah. have met in the faculty club, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Playing pool. Or yeah, no, drinking I really, beer. <laughs> I really have Sam Silverstein to thank for launching me um, on a career in science. Cool. I just saw him recently on the street. Yeah, how's he doing? So low. He's a little bent over. He's uh, yeah. You know, he's, I know he's had a number of replacements, joint replacements. Indeed. And the last time I really heard some bad news was when he tried to re-summit. Mount, I know. Mount Can you Ebris. believe that? Yeah, and he just he got halfway up and couldn't make it. Uh, I had lunch with Sam 
Silverstein recently. Oh, uh, nice. And uh, afterwards, he said, come here. Can you can you just sit with me for five minutes? And you know that's an hour. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you must know uh, Hirsch as well then. Uh, not well, but oh, okay. um, certainly the name. Right. Yeah. So I thought. Uh, it's Dixon was looking lonely out in his outer office. Yeah, so you know, I invited him to join us. There was there was enough of a quorum sensing molecule to drag me in. <laughs> oh no, well, we're going to have that kind of twim. Yeah, I'm that's afraid fun. so. <laughs> Dixon's pretty pretty bad with the. Um, My degree is in microbiology. Humor. Get this one. I got it at Notre Dame, working on germ free animals. <laughs> well, you know that's that's where a lot of the pioneering work on notobiotics came out. Exactly. Of. So I consider myself an a microbiologist. Microbiologist. <laughs> All right, we are going to give away a book today, and I'm not going to tell you about it till later. That may stimulate some email. This has been a little bit. There's been there's been a dearth of email on Twim lately, so maybe this book will stimulate it. But uh, before that, you have to uh, listen to a snippet and a paper, and we'll start with Michael with really a very cool snippet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th this one in honor of the location that I was yesterday. I was actually in Wisconsin yesterday, uh, America's Dairyland, and uh, the papers that we're going to have as a snippet today is the nasal microbiota of dairy farmers is more complex than the oral microbiota and reflects occupational exposure and provides competition for staphylococci. And the paper is by uh, Sanjay Sh Shukla, Jean Yi, uh, Scott Sandberg, Iris Reyes, Thomas Fritch, and Matthew Kiefer. And they're all located at the Marshfield Clinic uh, Research Institute, which is located in Marshfield, Wisconsin. And uh, Dr. Kiefer has recently moved to, I believe, the VA Puget Sound, or he may have always been at the VA Puget Sound. And so uh, since we're missing Elio, so I'm going to start the way he often does. Here, here's the sortie. Many of you <laughs> know that allergic and autoimmune diseases have been attributed to uh, the lack of exposure to biodiversity. And for those of you who have been following us for some time, this is an old variant or chestnut of the hygiene hypothesis that was proposed back before there even was the word microbiome in 1989. And the hygiene hypothesis is, is pretty straightforward. It, it proposes that uh, the lack of an early childhood exposure to infectious agents or symbiotic organ microbes, such as the gut flora or probiotics, and in honor of Dixon, parasites increases susceptibility. I want to, to clarify allergic... that I'm not a parasite. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, Although I've been characterized that way. You've been called worse, right? I it, have it, been called it, worse. It, it's your passion. It's your passion. <laughs> and uh, increases susceptibility to allergic diseases by suppressing the natural development of the immune system. And, you know, it's also been bandied around in the literature as the biome depletion theory and the lost friends theory. So here the authors are proposing that the microbiome of healthy dairy farmers would be richer in biodiversity than the microbiome of non-farmers living in urban settings, principally due to the greater exposure to the microbes that they encounter through their everyday life of milking cows and mucking out stay mucking out the barn and cleaning everything up and so they're exposed to quite a few microbes and up to this point in time there have not been studies asking the this principal question you know namely does your profession if you will actually um uh, help predetermine what you're going to be uh, colonized with. Some of you may recall from our discussions about Jack Gilbert's work from the Department of Surgery at the University of Chicago that if you live with a dog or a cat, your microbiome will actually reflect that you do indeed have a pet in your home. But here Shukla and colleagues want to investigate this relationship between the microbiota of dairy farmers contrasting against urban non-farmers. And so they addressed their question, as you might guess, they compared the nasal and oral microbiota of dairy farmers against the, the microbiota, 
principally the nasal and oral of urban individuals from the same area. And it's important that they use the same area because of all of the demographics. And what they principally learned is that the nasal flora of dairy farmers showed a significantly higher microbial diversity with hundreds of unique genera that suggested to the authors that environmental slash occupational exposure was indeed uh, significant in determining what was going to live in your urinaries. And the nasal and oral microbiomes clustered separately from each other using the standard principal component analysis. Uh, and they found that the dairy farmer harbored twofold greater complexity in their nasal flora and one and a half fold greater exclusive genera in their mouth when they compared it to um, the non-farmer. Interestingly, the nasal community of, of the dairy farmer group had a much lower burden of staphylococcal species, again, suggesting the correlation between higher microbial diversity and competition for colonization by the staphylococci. And so as you begin to think about this paper, just by reading the abstract, you say, well, this sort of all makes sense. But the reason I, I, I picked this paper is one of the individuals that I've been working on in one of the comms, the Council of, of Microbial Sciences, which is uh, an advisory body to the board of directors of the American Society for Microbiology. Uh, he sent me an email asking about uh, staphylococci in, in farmers and wanted to know about livestock exposure. So when I began to investigate his question, I stumbled into this paper and I thought it would be a really neat snippet to, to introduce this new group and to reacquaint our audience with the hygiene hypothesis and really begin to look at the complexity of the nasal flora of, of humans and contrast it against the oral community. And uh, it was uh, really pretty interesting. And, and this group also did indeed query whether or not the scary MECA gene was present in the community of microbes in the nares of, of dairy farmers. And fortunately, it was absent. And so that's good news for dairy farmers. And in fact, it wasn't all that significant in the non-farmers as well. So it was a really fascinating treatise on, on how they approached this problem. And as I said, what they did is they principally used the V4 region. So this is not total genome sequencing. This is uh, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing using the V4 region of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And they um, went after 21 different dairy farmers aged 20 to 64, and they had an equivalent number of non-farmers from an urban setting. And demographically, there was no remarkable difference for him. And what always blows my mind, having grown up in an era of Sanger sequencing, is how many sequences it now takes to make some of these remarkable conclusions that these authors came up with. They looked at 10 million sequences from 78 different clinical samples. And when you pair that down, they had 118,000 reads and, and you're going, my goodness, there is so much work going on here. And, you know, There's so much life, so much life in the noses of those farmers and non-farmers. That's what was remarkable. And one of the things that I like reading these straightforward papers that have an obvious conclusion up front is their obvious conclusion up front was dairy farmers didn't need have a more complex or a nasal community and a more complex oral community. But what they introduced me to is a term I hadn't recalled, and this was something called the Chow Richness Factor, and I put into the show notes a PDF that the author Chow put into her page, and it's freely available to individuals for review, and it really describes 
the uh, statistics of how you can determine species richness using a sample size of 21 farmers and an equivalent or thereabout equivalent number of non-farmers. And it uh, gives you the, the base statistics behind estimation and comparison. And what's really remarkable about the way uh, Shukla and colleagues presented their data is the beautiful figures that they showed. They, they have rich color figures showing the, the major phyla between the two groups. And you start off with that first figure of just looking at this box plot of a chow one richness. And when you look at it, they had four groups in their study. They had the nasal community of a dairy farmer. They had the oral community of a dairy farmer. And similarly, they had the same two groups from the non-farmers. And you don't need an advanced degree in statistics to notice in that first box plot, the nose of the dairy farmers was significantly different than the other three groups. And it really sets the tone of what's actually going on. And the nasal microbiome of the dairy farmers was indeed richer and more diverse. And as Michelle tumbled into, it was extremely diverse in terms of the number of organisms that were present. And when you begin to look at the organisms that are there, many of them are old friends of those of you who are familiar with the major families that live in the oral cavity, namely the firmicutes, the actinobacteria. The firmicutes, recall, are the garden variety gram positives, the clostridia, the bacillus, the staph, the strep. The actinobacteria include the gram negatives like Haemophilus, Echinella, and the proteobacter, of course, are your friends E. coli. They also had the Bacteroideates, which are Bacteroides and other gram negatives. And of course, the stinky bacteria, namely the Fusobacteria species that are there. And these were the, the principal families that were coming out of this group. And when they compared and contrast the nasal community, it, it had significantly higher numbers of these bacteroides and actinobacteria in the nasal samples compared to the oral bacteria. And in fact, they had hundreds of exclusive genera that were present in the nares of the dairy farmer. In fact, they had two times more genera. They had 1,189 unique genera versus the 552 genera that were present in the nasal flora of the non-farmer. And that, of course, was significantly different. They also looked at and the Michael, oral. And Michael, could I jump Please in? Please interrupt. Um, in addition to those box plots with the whiskers and all and the statistics, I also appreciated that in figure five, they included a classic Venn diagram that oh, yes. allows us to just glance really pretty quickly and appreciate that the nasal passages of the dairy farmers did have quite a lot of overlap with the non-farmers, mm -hmm. but they had, what, some 431 different phyla that were unique to the dairy farmer, mm -hmm. not seen in the control populations. And it's just, it's a very easy way to grasp those population yeah, distinctions. Yeah, it's very nice. Yep. And I also just want to emphasize these dairy farmers have a richer diversity and rich really is the right word here because in the literature with microbiomes, we are seeing again and again that the more diverse population you have on your body, on your surfaces, that correlates with better outcomes, more health. So just to make sure everybody, our audience understands that the increased number of different types of bacteria in the nose of the dairy farmers is actually probably a good sign, although they didn't do that analysis here. No, and, and in fact, I think, you know, there's a lot that one can take from this paper in terms of th thinking about things. Elio, in our early discussions in the microbiome when we, we were reporting sequencing, talked about, well, you're, you're developing a New York 
city telephone directory with millions of entries. So what does it mean? Well, they began to to do that richness analysis, and this is where I was going to introduce the, the Venn diagram, figure five, where they begin to talk about the common genera. So there were 503 common genera, or 28.9%, which I then coined the term, is this the core microbiome of the nose? Like we have a core genome of an organism, is this the core microbiome of the nose? And when you can't contrast that to the core oral organisms that were common between the non-farmers and the farmers, that was about a, that was 28.6%. So it lead me channeling Elio's thoughts of thinking about, so what? You got all these different bacteria, but what does it really mean? You looked at this core microbiome of the nose. There were unique 503 common genera. And similarly in the oral cavity, there were 28.6 28.6 or 279 organisms common to the oral samples. And, you know, but the nasal samples from the dairy farmer had 431 exclusive genera. And they, they have a nice table where they compare and contrast the microbes in the the farmer versus the microbes in the non-farmer. And since this is a snippet and we don't have that much time to to get into it, um, I'll leave that for the audience to review the comparison and, and contrasting because I think it's important that as you read this paper, and again, this is one of the PLOS papers, uh, so it's in the public domain, so you have ready access to to see the figures and to see the paper. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the top five relatively uh, abundant Nares species from the dairy farmer, you see that about 20% were crinibacteria. bacteria. The staphylococci, only about 9.4%. Then they have a gram-negative moroxella at 8.1%. An organism I had never heard of, Dolisaglarium, was at 7%, and streptococci were down at 3.3%. Contrasting that to the non-farmer, the staphylococci are high at 346 but interestingly, the carines are very similar in percentage, 19.7 in the in the farmer versus 19.9 in the non-farmer. And again, the common species of Moroxella in the farmer was 8.1, the non-farmer was 8.5. But instead of having that unusual organism, Delosaglarium, they had Pseudomonas right. in the non-farmer. I thought that was interesting. And, and, you know, Pseudomonas is this soil organ – it's a soil organism, Sorry. so I, I, I would have expected that more in the farmer where they have hay mm-hmm. and the cows are bringing in dirt from the fields, and but it was remarkably absent from the farmer it, in, in the sense it didn't make the top 5%. And then you had peptino, peptinophilius, a, again, an organism I'm not familiar with, and it was at 5%, so it's it's obviously must be going after a peptide given its name, but you know it was interesting looking at what was going on there, and what was remarkable is when they contrasted it to the oral flora, the oral flora really wasn't any different between the two groups. The oral mm-hmm. flora of the farmer was effectively not significantly different than the oral flora of the non-farmers. So that may be due to the diet that we all have in common. And, you know, the oral cavity is a portal of entry for that particular occasion coming on in. But Michael, you know, table- Michael, if yes, please. I, I liked I liked um, your thought about um, this type of approach to identify for the first time the core genera, I guess we'd have to say, of the nasal pharynx. But but in this particular case, because they looked at such a small population, 
21 farmers from two different farms in one area of Wisconsin, and they sampled only on one day in June. I think this is the first contribution to that effort, but they'll need to do Mm. additional populations and also, I would guess, different seasons. I'm guessing what we have in our nose in June is probably different from what we have in, say, late December. (laughs) Oh, yes. It's much drier here. And so I think the criny bacteria will actually win out. And in fact, that's one of the limitations of their study, as as you brought out. And that's what I was going to bring up just before you did, uh, is the limitation of, of, of studies like this is it's driven by the size of the species. And again, this is just one of the first. It's a unique community. Dairy farmers are, are unique. And they point out in their discussion that they specifically targeted dairy farmers over other types of farmers, those that are grain farmers or farmers growing um, crop that truck farm type farmers where they're growing uh, crops that go into what we would assume the farmer's market, things like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash and watermelon and all of the things that we seasonally are in delight when you go to the farmer's market throughout throughout the summer. So this is but phase one. And in, so in, in summary, uh, keeping to our, our time of making a snippet to tease the audience to go in and look at this in great detail, the authors did conclude that dairy farmers do indeed have a rich microbial community, significantly richer than non-farmers. Uh, the oral cavity between the two groups wasn't statistically or significantly different than one another. And they are encouraging us to think about the hygiene hypothesis or the microbial friends theory that, you know, as you're exposed to these things, it may lessen the likelihood of autoimmune type occurrences like asthma and allergies that we common associate with. And that's, of course, where the hygiene hypothesis came from is asthma and, of course, hay fever. So I commend this paper for for you all to take a look at. It's a great paper from looking at it from the perspective of how to present complex data sets that you can easily digest. I would encourage you to look, if you spend any time on the paper, look carefully at figure five, because it really shows you the power of a Venn diagram in figuring out what's remarkable when you begin to compare and contrast these things. And I think, as Michelle pointed out, we're going to need many more communities of of farmers included in this. Wisconsin is but one. We all know where happy cows are. They're out in California. And so is the the nasal flora of a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, where yesterday it was minus nine below, and it doesn't get that cold in California where the happy cows are. So <laughs> except the ones that are caught in the fires. Except right. the ones that are <laughs> caught in the fires. Um, so we we want to take a look at it, and it's it's a really neat study, and it didn't get at Tyler's question. Uh, Tyler Ratke is the one who asked me the question about. Uh, what's going on with uh, if there's any correlation with um, farm staphylococci entering the clinical community. Uh, But this was the first study showing that the nasal microbiota of dairy farmers is, is, is different than non-farmers. So, so if one of these farmers went to the city for six months with, with the nasal microbiome change completely, we don't know. Good question. Yeah. We stable? don't know. Because you would, you would imagine that, well, you some people are going to be born and raised and live their whole lives on a dairy farm, right? So is it right. is their microbiome stable even if they leave, right? Are the health mm-hmm. benefits going to stay with them if there are health benefits? Because we don't know, right? Yes. Is your immune system already imprinted yeah. by that early exposure? Yeah. So somebody here lives in South Carolina, and they don't have a lot of dairy farms in South Carolina, but they have a lot of pig farms. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I do indeed. The parasite I worked on all my life, trichinosis, is associated with that particular animal. But So I would wonder how this plays out with regards to two things. One is that 
I want to know whether or not farmers have fewer allergies or mm. not. Yeah. And it seems to me that they, they have as much hay fever as most other people, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and then the kinds of cows that are raised for dairy farming, uh, they're not all the same. Mm. So it would be very interesting to see how this varies sure. with the sure. cow type. Yep. And and thirdly, of course, is to see whether it has any clinical correlations with any yeah, of these sure. uh, hypotheses. Yeah. And they point that out about the the dairy species, the the species of cow that they were looking at. And as Michelle pointed out, this was from two farms. But exactly. you know, they already had ten million sequences in the bank. So That's incredible. That is incredible. It's it it's a lot of work. <laughs> and the question is. You know, you you begin to to push it forward, and is you know how many studies do you need to conduct in order to begin to determine the sorts of experiments that need to be done next? And I think that's where the big data community begins to come after us, because as we all know, since this was the the season of big data, if you made the mistake of shopping on Amazon or any of these other online websites and you accidentally clicked on a coat or clicked on a pair of shoes, <laughs> what you saw in your in- internet browser for the next four days was that same coat or that same pair of shoes. <laughs> yep, you bet. <laughs> and so that's what I think we need to begin to bring to the science of the microbiome is to begin to incorporate all of these data sets together in a similar manner that Facebook and Amazon does to begin to understand shopping trends and and whatnot. And so you can well imagine that one of the unique species of the nose of a dairy farmer could be that coat or pair of shoes that you were looking at when you were shopping on Amazon. And, you know, if you get another dairy farmer looking at something else or a farmer or an individual in the city, you know, should you suggest that pair of coat or, you know, all, all of those things. And I think we're at the beginning. So that's why I put into the show notes, these two little guides on species risk richness estimation and some of the underlying statistical theory behind how these studies are beginning to be assembled. You know, thoughts, creep into everybody's mind when you listen to all this for the first time. And of course, the group that I would really love to see some of these studies done on is a large animal and a small animal vet. Oh yeah. There are tons of veterinarians out there and they, and they get their hands way inside these animals. (laughs) Oh yeah. And they'd they'd be willing participants. They sure would be. They would be. They would be. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. So before we move on, I want to give a shout out to Marshfield, Wisconsin. So this study (laughs) was done by a group at the Marshfield Clinic Research Institute and Um, Marshfield is a town of about 20,000 people midway between Green Bay and Minneapolis. Mm. And by looking at the World Wide Web, I learned that they are highly ranked by a number of studies for their quality of life. They are proud to be considered one of the best places to live in Wisconsin. They have um, a couple of healthcare facilities that they're proud of and parks and a, a great way of life. So I want to um, thank the about 40 uh, citizens from that area for contributing to this study. I I learned that 33% of dairy farmers take less than one shower per day. Yeah. I I didn't bring up all the demographics (laughs) because how many of those live alone? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I was going to say those would be the bachelor farmers. (laughs) By contrast, uh, only 6% of non-farmers take less than a shower per day because they have to work. They have to be around other people. Right. (laughs) So they have to take, that was really interesting. Right, right, right. But maybe they're they're taking baths. Yeah. Their their demographic study has how many have household pets, whether they have a dog, a cat, a horse, a rodent, a rabbit, fish, um, birds, fish, birds. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So it their (laughs) demographic table really gives you how much work this this group indeed put into this fine study, and so it's an interesting snippet. It's it's easy to get through. The statistics are approachable if you use the resources. So. It's a good snippet. All right. Thank you, Michael. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Our paper was suggested by listener Hannah, 
who wrote uh, back in May, my lab's journal club is doing this paper today, and I thought it'd be a good fit for TWIM or maybe even TWIVO. It's about insect endosymbionts that regulate their own virulence through quorum sensing. Basically, at the beginning of the infection, the bacteria produce a lot of toxins, but but when they sense that they've colonized, thanks to quorum sensing molecules, they suppress all those virulence factors. This allows them to establish a persistent infection without further injuring the host. All of this has implications for how mutualistic relationships with microbes can arise, which I think is pretty cool. So the paper was published in Cell Host and Microbe. It's called Quorum Sensing Attenuates Virulence in Sodalis Precaptivus. And the authors are Shinichiro Enomoto, Abhishek Chari, Adam Larson Clayton, and Colin Dale. And they're all from the University of Utah, the Department of Biology. Now, on Twin, we have talked multiple times about endosymbionts of eukaryotes, bacteria that live within eukaryotes. And there are only certain phyla of bacteria that are predisposed to enter these kinds of mutualisms. One of them is the Sodalis uh, genera, of course, Wolbachia, another one. And really, why, why this is limited is an interesting question. And, you know, so these endosymbionts often provide metabolites uh, like amino acids, vitamins, and they can be used, uh, they can be uh, made by a wide variety of bacteria. So that doesn't explain why certain phyla would become uh, endosymbionts, but maybe it's uh, the genetic adaptability of the bacteria that's involved. They, they discuss a bit this, this problem of virulence when a bacterium enters a eukaryotic cell tends to be virulent, which of course might end up killing the cell. And so to become a mutualist, you have to suppress that. And that is going to allow the the bacteria to survive inside the eukaryote. And that's one of the things they investigate here. And their system involves this um, insect endosymbiont Sodalis precactivus, which usually is inside a grain weevil host. And it is related to other uh, similar organ, other Sodalis endosymbionts. One of them is an endosymbiont of the tsetse fly, which is uh, uh, Sodalis glossinidius, which Dixon must know very well. Oh, well, you'd know the tsetse fly very Rolls well. right off my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> off my oral cavity. I'm so sorry. that's an actual <laughs> mutualist, that one. And that's why this comparison is interesting between Sodalis precaptivus and the others, because Sodalis precaptivus is not yet a mutualist. It comes and goes within the eukaryotes, okay? They have to be reacquired uh, all the time by horizontal transfer, whereas the mutual, the actual mutualists are vertically transmitted from mother to offspring. And they live their entire life. You know, these these uh, eukaryotes, the, the weevils or whatever they are, the CC flies, have to live with them their entire lives, whereas the Sodalis precaptivus is interesting because they're reacquired. Right, so they're not maternally transmitted, and so it's a transient association. So you may ask, why would a bacterium have a transient association with uh, a, a bug of some kind? And we don't know the answer, but they suggest it may be an intermediate vector to transmit it to another host. Stink bugs, for example, feed on uh, trees, and so they say maybe the stink bug is giving it to the tree, and that's the function of it. So the point here is that Sodalis precaptivus is a nice model because it may be an intermediate. So these related Sodalis species all arose from a common ancestor, and some of them are mutualists and some of them are not. So maybe you could learn something about what it takes to be a mutualist or to become a mutualist by studying the ones that aren't yet. And and Vincent, I've just learned that the word (laughs) Sodalis is Latin, and it means companion, fellow, intimate, accomplice. Nice. Perfect so, name, right? From solidarity. Yeah, really reinforces yeah, that's the, right. Um, solidarity. Yeah. Solidarity mm-hmm. with Sodalis. Yeah. Right. Okay. So in this paper, what they do, they use Sodalis uh, precaptivus to study what it takes to become a mutualist. Remember, Sodalis precaptivus is not yet a mutualist. And what they focus on is quorum sensing uh, as a way of achieving a mutualism. And this, of course, is a system whereby bacteria make a pheromone, which increases as the bacterial density increases, and at a certain threshold concentration, it interacts with regulators in the bacterium, and it changes gene expression. And so a really 
well-known effect is the ability to make bacteria glow by the production of luciferases. And that happens only at a certain density of bacteria, which is regulated by these quorum sensing molecules. So they wanted to know, is quorum sensing in Sodalis precaptivus involved in, um, in somehow regulating its interaction with the host? So the first experiment they did was simply to ask, does precaptivus make a quorum sensing molecule? And glossinid- glossinidius, which is the sodalis from tsetse flies, is known to make a a um, a, a quorum sensing molecule, which is called N three oxohexanoal homoserine lactone, which we will abbreviate as OHHL. Right. So that is the molecule produced and which communicates within the bacterial community. And they have a cool assay. They take it, make an extract of the precaptivus. They, they fractionate it by thin layer chromatography. And then they take the sheet, which they've used to separate the extracts of the bacterium, and they overlay it with another bacterium that has a reporter in it, which will produce a blue spot when there's the homoserine lactone present. Isn't that cool? They don't it's have very to, cool. You don't have to do any mass spectrometry. <laughs> Bactoblot. <laughs> Bactoblot, yes. <laughs> so by this, they can tell that glus, that uh, Precaptivus makes a OHHL, uh, and that's important for the rest of the paper. Now, OHHL is synthesized by uh, an enzyme encoded by uh, the YPE1 gene, and, the, and they can see by looking at the genome of these sodalis that they have this gene, and they're also genes involved in response to the lactone and that's known uh, and, and they can compare the genomes of precaptivus and uh, glossinidius and see that there are two genes. They're called YPER and YENR. And these are response elements. They're important for the response to the lactone. Now all of these are going to come up as important players. I know it's hard to remember them, but just remember the lactone, which is the quorum sensing molecule is produced by one gene YPE1, and then there are two other different genes involved in the response to it. And so, Vincent, this is really the classic gram-negative quorum-sensing circuitry Mm -hmm. that some of our listeners may be familiar with. One, the quorum-sensing molecule is made. It's thrown out into the medium for free for all other microbes to to Mm -hmm. investigate and then it freely diffuses back into, if you will, the responding organism, and that homoserine lactone moiety then serves as a positive activator to activate transcription in the respondent bacterium mm-hmm. of a particular behavior. Right. So that's in contrast to the gram-positive quorum sensing system that uses a peptide. So this is the right. canonical gram-negative quorum sensing circuitry that many of you may have been familiar with. It's it's found in many of the common textbooks because, as Vincent said, it was the one that gave us light. So the typical right. homo serine lactone effect on in Vibrio is to make light, right? And that yes, is, it it interacts the the, the lactone interacts with uh, Lux R response elements to turn on the production of luciferase. And then the, the squid, which bear the vibrio will then glow at night. So they're not eaten by um, predators swimming below them. So here in the genome of this, so Dallas, they can see Lux R like response genes. And those are the y- YPER and YENR genes. And those are genes that will respond to the homo serine lactone and have the effects, whatever the biological effects are in this particular bacterium. So um, to go through just a few of the experiments they did first, they want to know what genes in precaptivus are regulated by this homoserine lactone. And they simply treat uh, bacteria in culture. They take bacteria lacking the synthetic gene for the homoserine lactone. Okay. So it's, you have no activity. They add homoserine lactone and then they ask what RNAs are turned on or turned off. They do transcriptomic analysis. And lucky for them, 30 genes <laughs> were... 30, not 800. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, if this were eukaryotes, it would be 800 or 1,000. A veritable plethora. And you would be, if you wrote a grant to look at them, they would say, no way. That's right. Fishing, fishing expedition. expedition. Yeah, fishing expedition. Guess what? I'm in. very good at fishing. But here, there are 30 genes with greater than fourfold changes, and most of them, 26, showed a decrease in expression in response to this homoserine lactone. And right. these so are rather than turning on a light, we're turning turn it off. off. And these genes that are turned off, they can tell what they do because they look at the protein and there are other proteins in the database that are similar. They're functions associated with causing disease of insects like toxins, chitinases, which would digest the, the chitin protective shell of the insect, right? A, Get a very soft roach. <laughs> digest the insect from within collagenases and so forth. All right. So those uh, keep in mind, we'll come back to those. And then four genes went up. Okay. And two of these are called CPMA and CPMJ. We will come back to them again. All right. Now I take a little detour here and, and go back to these responsive. These Lux are like responsive genes, YPER and YENR. It turns out that these are seem to be transcriptional regulators. They're involved in the response to homoserine lactone. Uh, exactly what they're doing, they're not sure, but keep that in mind. There's this interaction between the biosynthetic gene that makes homoserine lactone, and then there's these other two genes that regulate the response to it. Okay, now here, here's the cool part. This is all background so far. They noticed. This is where good stuff always begins. We noticed <laughs> during the course of <laughs> the our course work, of our study. we casually observed <laughs> the wild type strain. So we have two strains of pre-captivus. We have a wild type and one with a deletion in the gene, the biosynthetic gene for almost this homoserine lactone. And they, they noticed that the wild type growth rate was, was really much less than the mutant, which can't make uh, the homoserine lactone. And they validated that by showing that if you add the homoserine lactone itself to both wild type and mutant strain, it will, it will inhibit their growth. So in other words, the quorum sensing molecule is inhibiting the growth of these bacteria. And of course, these remember these two Lux are like responsive genes, which I said were transcriptional regulators. If you delete them, then the homoserine lactone doesn't affect the growth of the bacteria. So that, and that makes sense because we know those the product of those two genes are involved in the response to the worm sensing molecule. And they do some cool mixing experiments where they, uh, they mixed um, wild type and mutant strains. And they could show you that it's in fact this, this quorum sensing molecule that's causing the inhibition of bacterial growth. So why, what is the gene responsible for, growth suppression caused by the homoserine lactone. They, they made mutants of the pre-captivus and they looked for mutants that relieved, relieved the growth suppression caused by the homoserine lactone. And they found that CMPA is a major gene involved in growth suppression caused by homoserine lactone. And you may remember but you won't, so I'll remind you that CMP <laughs> was one of the two, four genes that went up when you treated cells with uh, the homoserine lactone. So exactly what it's doing, they're not sure, but it is clearly responsible for uh, relieving growth suppression caused by the presence of the homoserine lactone. So then the next experiment is to take weevils. These are adult grain weevils. They treat them with antibiotics to reduce their own native symbionts. And then they inject the precaptivus into them. They can inject wild type or they can inject a mutant that cannot make the quorum sensing molecule. So what do you think happens? They look at these injected weevils. At one week, the ones that got the strain lacking the ability to make the quorum sensing molecule they started to get lethargic, and then they died over the next few weeks. They became the lesser of two weevils. <laughs> <laughs> the lesser of two weevils. Very good. Uh, that could be the title. And the wild type injected weevils were fine. Right. So that if you, must have been a great 
period in the lab yeah. to start you know, collecting this data. Okay. That's and a Louis Pasteur response. <laughs> you know, yeah. He comes back the next morning, claps his hands, and only half of the sheep wake up. <laughs> you know that? No, I don't, I don't know that story. It's, it's, it's from the um, vaccination of sheep against, um, I'm just trying to think. Rabies? Which, yes, that's correct. So he clapped. He clapped. They, they were all asleep. He thought they were all dead. And, and, half and only of them, half of them were. And those were the vaccinated ones? That's correct. <laughs> Good wow. story. All right. So if you are wild type for this, the biosynthetic gene for this quorum sensing molecule, you're fine. But if you take out the, the quorum sensing gene, you die. So it not only slows the rate of growth down or division cycle. Well, we don't know exactly, but they're they don't not say, uh, yeah, they don't and say. they don't say whether they're killing or, or right, it's just a right. growth inhibition. If you wash away the quorum sensing, do they rejuvenate? Yeah. Do, we, do we know that this uh, approach has identified any new toxins that might be useful for insect control? Well, they do identify some toxins. I don't think they're new though. Okay. Um, but they have mm-hmm. some other things that are involved. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. So now uh, they take this, this school experiment and they make, double mutants where they combine the biosynthetic gene, the, the gene that encodes the bios, the enzyme that produces the quorum sensing molecule, along with a, a deletion in one of these two regulatory responsive genes. And um, the, in fact, if you, if you combine the two responsive elements, if you mutate both of those together, that will kill as effectively as a deletion lacking the biosynthetic gene. Uh, and here, in fact, I misspoke earlier. Here they do the mixture of wild type and mutant strains. If they mix a wild type bacteria with one of the with the biosynthetic mutant, which kills the um, the weevils, the wild type will suppress the killing in trans. So it's obviously making a secreted substance, right? But uh, if you mix wild type bacteria with bacteria mutated in the response elements, the wild type will not mitigate the killing of them because they can't respond. Because the, mm. the YPER and the YEN are, are responsive elements for the the uh, quorum sensing element. Those are beautiful experiments. Yeah, so this is great because you have an animal model, an insect model, and mm-hmm. you can manipulate the bacterium and, and know exactly what's going on. So you can say, okay, this quorum sensing molecule is somehow um, protecting the strains. And you feel like a genius. <laughs> what kind of medium do they use to grow these things in vitro? Yeah, I would have to look it up. I don't okay, know. Just standard microbial medium. Then maybe. Uh, to grow the bacteria? Yeah. I don't know. Well, we can look it up very quickly here. Let's see. Well, of course, the, uh, the materials and methods are not in the PDF. <laughs> Hold it. Here we go. Insects. Um, I'm just curious. Maybe... They are grown on organic whole yellow maize, by the way. Ha. <laughs> what do you mean the weevils? Uh, and the symbiont free weevils were generated by treating with rifampicin. But let's get to the bacteria. Here we go. Bacteria were grown in LB. There you go. Oh, a lousy medium. That's <laughs> just the standard. So the insect LB. doesn't contribute anything to the bacteria's ability to reproduce. Well, the bacteria can be grown. No, no, of course. But in so, the so symbiont, well, Buck, yeah, Right. So this, that's a good point. These uh, captivas have not lost genes right. that they need to, to grow on their own. Right. Because they're not endosymbionts. And they're well, just well, transient yeah, that's uh, right. That's right. partners in this that's association. Right. So they're more versatile metabolically. Exactly. Yep. But the one in tsetse flies, they have undergone genome reduction. They have lost genes. So they may not be able to grow on their own. They're stuck inside the fly. Stuck. Yeah, they're feeding inside. off free, free <laughs> yeah, nutrients. That's right. All right. So now we know that uh, this quorum sensing molecule is involved in weevil killing. So what gene is involved? So they can do another screen. They can uh, look at some of these genes that were differentially expressed that they looked at early in the in the in the work, and ask if you combine if you knock them out in a a uh, weevil in a bacterium. I keep confusing the weevils and the bacteria. If you knock them out in a bacterium that lacks the ability to synthesize the quorum sensing molecule, then you inject those into weevils mm. and you see which suppresses the killing. None of the double mutants were completely relieved of their ability to kill weevils, but there were s- some that were s- significantly suppressed. And in fact, a, a gene called Reg C, which turns out to be a transcriptional a transcription factor, so it probably regulates some other genes that are involved in the killing, so we don't know what's going on there. But combining the biosynthetic gene with the two, these two genes called PEER-A and PEER-B, these encode toxins that are probably 
lethal uh, for the insect. Uh, that combination delays the killing. And pure A and, B, and pure B are a binary toxin complex. Okay, and so uh, you need both of these for killing activity. And so that is probably one main way that uh, the killing is, is is progressing. And of course, they they think there are other killers that they haven't um, identified yet as well. And finally, the last experiment, uh, they deleted this gene CPMA. Now you remember there are actually two genes, A and J. Uh, CPMA A and J were the original ones that were observed to go up when you add the quorum sensing molecule. Uh, they are involved in growth in uh, growth suppression. So if you add the, the quorum sensing molecule to these bacteria, it suppresses their growth and CPM A and J are involved in that. So they made a double mutant of CPM A and J. They inject that into the weevil. doesn't grow very well. So what does all this mean? We can put all, we could put most of this together. So we have a bacterium pre captivus. It enters uh, the weevil some point in, in life, and to enter and begin to replicate, it has to express factors like toxins, chitinases, right? And it grows, and those enable it to grow. But then, probably it, to get access, to right? Get it access. has to break down some barriers, insect right. barriers. And so these are mm -hmm. these are the things that are killing. But early in in the growth of this bacterium inside of the weevil. Of course, they don't want to kill it, but they're made at low enough amounts so that the we that the bacteria can enter, as Michelle says, and slip then, in. And mm -hmm. then, when the bacteria have reached certain numbers, they're producing these quorum sensing molecules, which then shut off the production of these toxins, so they're not going to kill the insect. And the responsive, we know that uh, CPM A, A J are involved in this shut off. If you, if, if you delete those, you, you can't even infect CPM A and J are involved in the production of these toxins in response to the quorum sensing molecules. And if, if you delete CPMA and J, the bacterium can't really get established, so they don't grow very well. So then you get lots of bacteria growing, you get the quorum sensing molecules produced, the toxins are shut off, and then you have a nice coexistence of the weevil with the bacterium for as long as you need. So the, this bacterium has learned how to modulate virulence. Right. When they're inside the weevil and when they've done that, where are they found? Are they found in the hemocele or are they found within cells? These are these are intracellular. Which cells? I don't know. They actually don't mention that, but I'm sure there's an extensive background on this. It would be wonderful to see which cells are the repository. Why, do you, why would it make a difference well, or be important? Well, because I think that if you had a transitional organism, like we have in parasitology, for instance, uh, strongyloides is a parasite that can reproduce in the soil by just eating bacteria, yeah, yeah. or it's an obligate parasite inside of a mammalian host. So you've got these two pathways that you can go to. Well, Bacchia never comes out of the cell, mm. whereas this, paras this presumable developmental endosymbiont enters the, the the weevil as a parasite and mollifies its behavior to become more friendly, as you put it. Right, right. So, and then which cells are the are the beneficiary of of this uh, relationship? And it would give you clues yeah. about yeah. transmission to the Indeed next it would. plant. Indeed yeah. it would. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Indeed it would. Yeah, it's and, a, I don't know how transmission occurs, but maybe they're shedding it. Yep. And I presume the chitinase is totally shut down, also, right? Yeah, the chitinase and the tox the 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 protein toxins, right. yeah, they all have to be shut down, and otherwise it would kill. Because you see, if we if we mess with the shutting down, we kill right. we kill the the response genes, we kill the adults. Yeah, exactly. Now the 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 CC fly uh, version of this um, bacterium, uh, Glossinidius, they don't have these quorum sensing regulated virions genes. They don't have the protein toxin. They don't have the chitinases. They don't need it because they don't have to enter. They're they're the given to new CC flies at birth. Right, right, and they just remain so they, they don't need any virulence factor. So Vertical. that's that's the idea emerging out of yeah. this paper, which I think is cool. Yep. You have a, a bacterium which is entering a host, and it, to do so, it has to express some virulence genes to get in. But then they're suppressed in order to allow the host and the bacterium to survive. And eventually, over time, if you wanted to make that a mutual, a true mutualism, you'd you don't need any of this quorum sensing business anymore, and you'd right. you'd switch to vertical transmission, and you'd just 
turn off. You don't need any of this. Uh, You're making it sounds like bacteria thinking about no, doing no, this. I don't, mean, <laughs> I don't mean to do that at all, but it's obviously no, I know, I it's know, obviously I know. An easy, easier to describe. Sure, it but they're way. selected for life by their metabolic uh, price tag. So there's a metabolic price to pay for making more genes. Right? Yeah, for sure. So they, they come to, they have a nice discussion with, I really like the evolution of virulence. Yeah, I like to point. think about that's it we, in viruses. We think about it all yeah, the time, exactly. but here, if you have a bacterium that want, that is evolving towards a mutualism, you have to reduce virulence. Right. All right. And in this case, we have a nice way of regulating it during a, a, an infection, but eventually you would lose the genes that, uh, accomplished virulence and then you go from horizontal to vertical transmission so here right. this particular precaptivus is still being transmitted horizontally but yeah, yeah. presumably at some point you would go vertical and how that happens you know at what point what right, are the conditions right. that's really yeah, interesting exactly. to think about. yeah again it probably depends on what cells they have access yeah, to yeah whether they can yeah. maint- be maintained in the germline yeah, exactly and the concentration of the homoserine lactone and that goes back to dixon's question about where the microbe is because it's how that homoserine lactone is going to get diluted. Remember, the microbe is giving it freely to the environment. Mm -hmm. And depending upon where that homoserine lactone goes, and those of you who remember your chemistry recall that a homoserine lactone moiety is not all that stable and it's easily degraded mm. by endogenous enzymes. So my suspicion is that this precaptivus is actually playing both ends. It's playing this <laughs> concentration game because it's to its advantage. And the Dixon, I think, may have tumbled to it. It's the compartment that the microbe is in, and that homoserine is enabling it to have that selective advantage so it downregulates itself so it continues to feed and reproduce until it needs to go away. And, you know, it's, it's all about that quorum of how many of the precaptivists are there as to determining this whole virulence cascade that we're witnessing. Yep. Yep. It's a cool system for studying this. That's, that's, you know, the experimental details aside, it's really, it's kind of a intermediate in the progression to, to mutualism. That's why it's neat to study. Yeah. I love the discussion, as you pointed out, Vincent, it really got me thinking about evolution of virulence yeah. factors, having to overcome host barriers. And then in thinking about the paper that Michael did and our appreciation for all the good that our microbiome provides us, <laughs> do you think that there's a new frontier in science where host cells are actually going to put out the welcome mat for microbes to try to encourage um, uh beneficial microbes to come and stay? If, if Lynn Margulis was alive today, I would love to hear her answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we love to talk about um, the fact that microbes outnumber our human cells by, you know, maybe an order of magnitude and Sorry. all the benefits that we get from them. So is it naive to think that the host only has defense systems and not welcome Matt's like, come on in. So that's a good question. The question is, you know, we have defense systems. And the question is, do these bacteria that colonize us, do they overcome them or do we lower the guard to let them in to a certain point? And I I recall a talk by Laura Hooper from uh, Southwestern. And she said, you know, the, the very thin layer above your epithelial cells in the gut the mucus. Uh, that's where it's you. You can. It's that war. That that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, <laughs> that's where this little fight is going on, and uh, right. I can't remember the details now. But uh, you can imagine that defenses may be lowered in certain areas to allow colonization for sure. Let's hear it for right. I, let's right. hear it for secretary IGA. <laughs> no, so that's an interesting question, and, and I think that systems like this will uh, will help understand what's going on there it's pretty cool all right anyway th- this is from the university of utah so uh i'll have to well if any, any of the authors are listening answer our questions about where these bacteria are and so forth if not 
I'll get uh, so my co-host Nels Zeldi of Tuivo is at Utah. He probably could. Yeah, the thing is, another intriguing thought here that is triggered by this whole thing is that these two life forms have been around for a very long which, time. Which two? The microbes and the insects. Mm-hmm. They've had plenty of opportunity to develop virtually every kind of relationship possible that you can imagine. And yeah. many of them are trapped in amber. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you could look back, you know, and see some. Into the genomes? Pick out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. I, I know a lot mm-hmm. of the DNA is destroyed in the process of uh, embalming in um, uh, that material. But you can also isolate a lot of material from it as well. I know you can't recreate a dinosaur, but you could certainly get some hints as to, because weevils are very old. I think it's a very old order of insects, by the way. And uh, it, they existed for a very long time. So Yeah, I think the ancient amber is not going to have any DNA left in it. No, no no more DNA, but maybe some hints at endosymbiosis if you could just maybe. cut across there. But you can't make dinosaurs from No, you can't make okay. dinosaurs from them. No, Sorry not about Not going to work. Sorry, kids. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> you can't have a mammoth for Christmas. Thanks, <laughs> Or Anna. a dinosaur for that matter. Uh, right. We have just a couple emails here. Let me read them. One is from Josh. I've been enjoying your show for several years now. I think your show's conversational style and exploration of topics allows for people of all backgrounds to enjoy complex topics related to biology. Every one of your hosts in the TWIM, TWIF, TWIP has a knack for presenting material very clearly, and your passion and excitement for the field is infectious. Your discussion in TWIM 166 about the PNAS paper, Contemporary H3N2 Influenza Viruses, have a glycosylation site that alters binding of antibodies elicited by egg adaptive vaccine strains was fascinating. I wanted to see if you had any speculations about why the egg environment might select for this glycosylation site mutation in HA. Thanks again to the podcasts. I don't know. That's a great question. So the glycosylation site is at the tip of the HA and that is where the receptor is interacting. So maybe you know, receptor utilization requires a change at the at the glycosylation site. What is interesting, uh, Josh, is that apparently the mutation is also selected for in cells in culture, mammalian cells in culture. So it's not just eggs. So it is some more general issue. I don't know what it is, but I would suspect it's receptor binding because, of course, there's no antibody in the egg or in the... Yep in the cell culture. So the selection has to be independent of antibody. Uh, Josh suggests a pick of the week. This is quite the hobby for anyone interested in microbiology or likes pretty things. And this is a um, compendium of photographs of aquaria and terraria <laughs> from all over the world. People have sent in pictures of their <laughs> terraria. It's very pretty. Check it out. Thanks for that, Josh. Uh, the next one's from Anthony. Raw pet food as a risk factor for shedding of extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Enterobacteriaceae in household cats. So this is a plus one paper, uh, which says feeding your cats raw pet food uh, will increase their likelihood of shedding these antibiotic resistant Enterobacteriaceae. I'm sorry, I don't understand Raw pet food. I thought it was all sold raw and eaten raw, but it's processed. No, I don't know. Um, I'm not quite There's sure. fresh pet. There's fresh pet out there. Um, pet food that you yeah, have to they, cook before they, you serve. No, it? they sell. They sell it in the refrigerated section. Really? You you walk into Walmart and you see this refrigerator <laughs> with looks like giant sausages, and it's fresh pet, mm. and it's ready to go, and it's raw meat. Um, that's been homogenized and there's some fillers added or not, depending on which version you buy. Not frozen, not frozen. It's fresh. Good Lord. Well, they, well, I guess tigers didn't used to. No, they don't. don't That's right. (laughs) But polar (laughs) bears did. (laughs) Well, anyway, they, they fed cats this food and then they sampled their fecal material, um, for three weeks. And then they looked for these particular (laughs) antibiotic resistance. (laughs) I, I know this is irrelevant to this conversation, but I actually was hired by a, a food company, a General yeah. General Foods, to look at Gainsburgers uh-huh. as to whether that's, or that's not that's pet food, right? Yeah, it's pet food. Okay, to whether or not it was toxic for Trichinella. They wanted to know if they could use pork in their product. 
I see. So mm-hmm. I, you know, they paid me a fairly good <laughs> side side dish, so to speak, of um, uh. laboratory funding to look at this, and it turned out that they use a preservative, and the preservative is ethylene glycol. Wow! Ooh. Pet food. Yeah. It's Very horrible. small amounts. Yeah. And believe it or not, that alone killed the trichinella larvae. Wow. Well, uh, Anthony continues, I was surprised to learn that quite a few people feed their cat raw food exclusively. In addition to the bacteria, there's the public health hazard of toxoplasma. Yes, freezing does kill a high proportion of the breedy zoites. In Russian roulette, a high proportion of the chambers in the gun (laughs) cylinders are empty. That doesn't make it a good idea. Dear, dear. Dixon, how many toxo would you need to infect the cat, though? Because one bullet will kill, but maybe one parasite microbe virus will not, right? They've done these studies, uh, believe it or not, in uh, lots of different animal hosts, including humans, for cryptosporidium. As to how many oocysts are necessary to initiate an infection. And for cryptosporidium, it was around 10. Uh-huh. For Toxo, I think it's less. They're highly infectious because of the data that they're collecting from the sea otters mm. off the coast of California because they're dying from toxoplasmosis and they're they're receiving very low doses to begin with. So I don't know the answer directly, but I think it's known if you look it up. Do you know anything about toxoplasma in raw pet food? Depends on the pet food. I mean, if you use lamb or if you use pork or mm. if you use uh, calf, and they're kept on a farm, and they're surrounded by cats. That's chances are hundred percent almost that they've all got it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And most farms have cats. They do because they have mice. <laughs> yes. Okay. And that's another story entirely. Well, my, but, our dogs get these little dried pellets. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's what I thought most cats. All right, one more from Richard. High esteemed professors, I haven't written in for a time, having stopped listening for a few years. It wasn't my choice, but due to a prolonged hospital stay. Oh, dear. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you're getting better. First, the weather here in Bristol, UK, is 3 degrees Celsius, cloudy with 5 kilometers per hour wind. There is a little snow on the ground that fell this morning. Regarding cooling towers, a subject I know a little about from my water treatment background, I can fill in some of your questions from TWIM165. Wet cooling towers are indeed a risk for Legionella. Usually there is a dosing system that constantly doses biocides into the cooling water. It's often, in the UK at least, the failure to maintain this that causes issues. Plus, as you say, resistant bacteria still grow. In the UK, dry cooling towers are preferred, and yes, generally made from copper. These don't use water, so are less problematic but less efficient. Vincent, as you say, water towers are closed, and generally drinking water supplies are dosed with chlorine dioxide. The level of chlorine dioxide in the water should sterilize it and prevent any Legionella. Hope that proves informative. P.S. Thanks for all the work you do, particularly with TWIV and TWIM. Though I have a lot of catching up to do, I intend to listen to every episode. I'm slowly working through about three years' worth while still in hospital. Now, what's a dry cooling tower? Does anyone know? It's just like your heat pump. It effectively passes the liquid inside a tube, uh-huh. and there are a bunch of uh, fins on that surround the tube, and you uh, blow air uh, across it, and okay. it dissipates the heat. Instead of using water cascading down the tower like we do Down here. the tower, yeah. It, yeah. it effectively adds surface area by having those fins, yeah. Yeah. and so it's not as efficient, but it does the trick. Oh, right. You just have to have a lots of aluminum fins on it. If you have copper fins, of course, the heat transfer coefficient's a little bit better. And it will stay, will have less contamination, but it doesn't, I guess that would it matter because you're blowing the air over the copper, right? Well, uh, the, it's the heat transfer coefficient. You can actually get better, uh, yeah, less sur- less surface area because the heat transfer from copper to copper is more efficient than copper to aluminum. Got it. All right. Finally, we're going to give away a book. This is an ASM Press book just came out. It's called, it's a hardcover, lovely book. See, you see Dixon here? It's Beautifully illustrated. Antisepsis, Disinfection, and Sterilization. And it's edited Good luck by on that. Gerald McDonald. <laughs> McDonald, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Gerald McDonald. And uh, it has it, wonderful chapters on. Wow, there's a lot of chapters here. Let me give you a sense here. Introduction. It has uh, physical disinfection, chemical disinfection, and that goes on for quite a while. Metals, 
antiseptics and antisepsis, physical sterilization, chemical sterilization, mechanisms of action, mechanisms of microbial resistance, 390 pages. And it's not just bacteria, it's viruses, trypanosomes, parasites, fungi, it's the whole deal. It's a brand new book, never read, never marked up by SM Press. Send an email to twim at microbe.tv. The subject of the email should be disinfection. And just, you know, you could write something and tell us about yourself, but we uh, will then go through all the emails and pick one at random to mail you this book. Antisepsis, Disinfection, and Sterilization. You can find TWIM at Apple Podcasts, asm.org slash TWIM. Please send us your questions and comments, TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out how you can do that. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, and Happy New Year as well. And thanks to the both of you for uh, spending part of your holiday week with TWIM. Dixon de Pommier can be found at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you for welcoming me into your fold. <laughs> you looked lonely out there, so. I was you not could. sensing the quorum. And you said you were going to be silent, and I told you <laughs> I told you, you wouldn't be silent. You forgot to feed me the IRNA. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of Twim and Ray Ortega for his technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 